is to be encouraged to worship God and also to hear the word of God, right? So that we can be encouraged to continue our walk with Him. And so this morning, we're going to continue our series on the Church Essentials. Last week, uh, we started off and Pastor started with prayer. That prayer is an essential part of being the church. Because why? Because we, when we pray, we're saying, hey God, we're dependent on you. And we know when we say we're dependent on Him, it changes things. In our, in our personal life, in our family, in our neighborhood, in our country, when we pray, man, God comes through. He does things. And so that's why prayer is an essential part to a growing church, to being a church. It, it, it has to be based on the dependency on God. Because, you know, Pastor and I, or each one of us, if it just was on us to, to, to see God's kingdom come in Madison, we couldn't do it. But with God, all things are possible, right? So that's why we pray. We say, God, we're dependent on you. Now we're going to continue this series this morning with discipleship. Discipleship is an essential part of the church. So let's turn together to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 17 here. Jesus is, is starting out his ministry here in Mark, and each one of the Gospels are really neat because they all record different aspects of, of Jesus' story, and they kind of, you know, just like if each one of us were to see a different event, like yesterday, yesterday I got to see two eagles soaring at Devil's Lake. It was phenomenal, and, and there's, a couple, there's a couple people from our group, so they, we all saw it from a different perspective. So we're all like describing it. That's, that's how the Gospels are. Each one of them are, are, are seeing Jesus, seeing this story, and each writing in their, kind of, their own perspective. But Mark chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus is getting ready to call his 12, his people. He's going to call to himself. And this is God's master plan, right? His plan to change the whole world. <coughs> It wasn't to get a really good marketing scheme. It wasn't to get a good social media presence, right? He said, I'm going to pick 12 guys, and I'm going to pour into them. And so he starts his whole ministry out here doing this. In Mark chapter 1, verse 17, it says, uh, or we'll start in 16, it says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. They were fishermen. And he said this, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. So we're talking about uh, discipleship. We're talking about the essential parts of the uh, parts of the church. We got to start with the basics. We got to start with Jesus' call, and his first call was "Follow me." The second part of that was, "I want to make you fish for men," which is really neat for the disciples that they're ones, at least these two, Andrew and Simon, ones that were already fishing. And so it's like saying, "Hey, you're going to be fishing, but it's not just going to, you're not going to catch fish. You're going to catch people." And so this is an essential a core value of Capital Church, that we are disciples, that we follow Jesus. And so these words, sometimes in Christian circles, they can argue about terminology, right? Whether we're Christians, believers, followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, and, you know, like we, we can go and maybe teach a sermon on each one and say, oh, right now we, we shouldn't call ourselves Christians, we say followers, the unbelievers, we say believers, and all those kind of things. But it, it's not really the, the terminology. Right? But it's really the, the process. Understanding the process. Jesus was saying to them, come follow me. And this is essential. If we're going to be a church that says discipleship is, is who we are, the essential part is, hey, we're going to follow Christ. That's going to be everything who we are. So how would we, at Catholic Church, how would we define this? How does it look to be a follower of Jesus? And we say this, that it's, it's increasingly submitting all of life to the Lordship of Jesus. So what Jesus was inviting these these two men into was he to say, hey, come follow me. I'm going to show you what it means to be part of the kingdom. I'm going to show you what it means to follow God. I'm going to show you what it means to be a, uh, to be a believer, to be a Christian. Follow me. I'm going to show you the way. And so we want to be a church that we say, hey, what is the central part of us? We want us to be a church that says, hey, come follow us. We're going to show you who Jesus is. We're going to show you the way. We're going to show you what Jesus, when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We're going to show each other, hey, how to follow Jesus, because he is ultimately the way. And this, for Jesus, it wasn't just a, a, an, optional, an optional thing. As we look in, uh, we look in Scripture, that discipleship, or making disciples, or helping others follow Jesus, 
It was like a mandate. It's not an option. So it wasn't just like, you know, we talk about, it would say, use just the title of Christian. Sometimes it was, we put Christian as a, as a label for us, and maybe that's our identity. It was very good. At one point, I made my decision to follow Jesus, and so now I'm a Christian. But as a Christian, right, it, it mandates or it, it shows us or it means that we're also disciple maker. They go hand in hand. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 26, let's turn there together. Kind of talking about this call that Jesus made to Simon and Andrew and others to be his disciple. There's a there's some integrate things here, there's a cost, there's an emphasis on, this is not an option, this is a daily thing. This is an ongoing process. So, Luke chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 23, it says this, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. So, like I said, in this room we have a bunch of people. Some have been around for here for a while, some have been following Jesus for a while, some, some of us are, are new to this, hey, being a disciple of Jesus, being a follower of Jesus, but we know that um, that being a disciple of Jesus is a lifelong process. So when we first come to know Jesus, usually we, we start with the, the aspect of an, an understanding of our need for Him. I need Jesus. I need the forgiveness that He offers me. But as we continue to walk with Him, it, in, in Luke chapter 9, it says it here that it's a, it's a daily process. It's a daily understanding of, oh, I need Jesus, I need you, I need you. And that's how we continue to live our life, to, to begin to be formed right into who he is. And so this call that Jesus makes to the disciples, Andrew and Simon, will you uh, come follow me? He's saying, hey, come and learn from me. Come learn the lifestyle, what it means to walk like I walk, to live like I live. And then we know if we've been around Jesus for uh, this Jesus thing for a little while, it's, a, it's more than just a one-day prophecy. It's a daily process of dying to self. Of being, uh, and, and that word, dying to self, is a hard thing, right? Take up your cross daily. Die to the self. Because I really, like we say a lot around here, we like self. Yeah. Sometimes, right, i got to be honest, sometimes I like what my life, I like to do. But when we're following Jesus, when we're becoming disciples, when we're becoming to be formed into His image, it's a lifelong process of us dying to ourselves, but we get Jesus. So we start looking more and more like Him in our everyday life. How many know it's a good thing when we look more like Jesus? Yes. That's just, we had a conversation the other day um, in our car. We're talking about when we, when I don't look like Jesus, then other people around me get my brokenness, and it, and it gets messy. Mm -hmm. And I would much rather people around me, my wife, my family, my neighbors, even to get Jesus than to get me. Because sometimes me kind of selfish sometimes, kind of prideful sometimes, kind of, kind of arrogant, you know, right? And so I, I want this process. I want to look more and more like him. Mm -hmm. I want to be a follower of Jesus, one that looks more and more like him, one that is submitting to his lordship or his rulership in every area of my life. So it's a lifetime process of being a disciple and making a disciple. And so when we're talking about it being a church essential, discipleship, Looking, looking more and more like Jesus in our everyday life. And there's two aspects to this process of discipleship that Jesus talks about. The first one we're going to look at is that every believer should be helping unbelievers become believers by showing them Jesus. So our responsibility, Jesus says, All right, come follow me and I will make you. He's going to make us into people that are going to be able to fish for men, that are going to help other people come to him. This is a basic thing of following Jesus. That is, it's not just pastor and I responsibility or the missionaries that are on campus or the missionaries that we, uh, we support around the globe. They're responsible to help other people, unbelievers, see Jesus. But each one of us, as believers, our responsibility is to make disciples, to see other people come closer to this. So let's look at this. And first is Mark, like I said, Mark chapter 1. 
verse 17. So when we come to Jesus, he says, follow me. But I love this. It says, follow me, and I will make you. So there's a transformation process that goes on. How many know when we come to Christ, right, we're confronted with the selfishness of what I like to do and what I want to do, and it conflicts with what Jesus is and, and the way that he wants to be. And so he's, he's going to make a transformation. I love it because Jesus doesn't leave us in the mess that we're in. He actually transformed us to look like him, and Jesus' heart was for the unbeliever, right? He said, I came to serve, not to be served. He said, I, I descended from heaven, right, so that, so that uh, for our sake. So Mark chapter 1, 17, he transformed us, or every believer is transformed. If we answer the call to follow Jesus, we're instantly now a disciple maker. We're instantly now a fisher of men. And we'll find it later, there's no qualifications for those who are, no qualification needed for those to make disciples. No, that's who we are. As a follower of Jesus, I'm one that makes disciples. I'm one that fish for men. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. This is a familiar verse whenever we talk about discipleship in church or when we talk about being disciples or making disciples. So you might know this one, but Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at verse 18 through 20. It says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, so he has the authority to say these things to us. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And so here we see a, a, the basic command of Christ. He's looking at the disciples. If you know the history of, of Jesus, it's right before he had... He, right after he had died on the cross, he rose again before he's ascending into heaven. And he makes this command, he makes this decree to his disciples. Go into all the earth, baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything I commanded you. So when we think about this, us sitting in this room is a result of the disciples obeying this command of God. Yeah. And so this is how the gospel message, the message of Jesus, is trans. Is, is transferred now to sitting in Madison, Wisconsin, opening the Word of God, having it in our language, it was because these 12 disciples said, you know what, I want to I do this, I want to obey Christ, I want to teach somebody else everything God's commanded me. And then somebody else took that and said, I want to teach somebody else everything God has commanded me. And went down the line, down the line, down the line, and then somebody came to me when I was a, just a little guy in elementary school, and I heard the Gospel, and I received the fact that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life and that I will be received by salvation. And then I begin to share that with my friends and I share the message. And, and, and if we're talking about the essential part of the church, how is the church going to continue in Madison? How is the church going to continue in the world? Is if we continue to be obedient to this command to say, I want to make disciples. I can make a disciple. What is a requirement to make a disciple? If we think about that. We're going to, we're going to talk about that a in a little detail. I remember I, I looked over at Angel. I remember an Angel, we, we were in uh, Dad's living room one time, and, and he said, you know, it's just one baker telling another baker where we found bread. He said he heard it from somebody else. So I heard it from Angel, and Angel heard it from somebody else. See, that's even discipleship right there. But they, that's, that's what it is. Hey, we're just telling somebody else. If I'm one step ahead of somebody else, hey, I, I just came to Jesus today. And I know now Jesus is my Savior, He's my Lord, He forgave me my sins. Now I have something to teach somebody else. Right? Some, I'm one step ahead of somebody else. All we have to be is one step ahead of somebody else to be able to disciple them, to tell them where we found this Savior, this joy, this peace that we have, this Jesus. So every believer is part of our identity as a follower of Jesus to make disciples, to tell somebody else what we know about Jesus. Secondly, as we talk about aspects of discipleship. One, it, is, it involves evangelism, right? It involves telling the other person who Jesus is. Everything we know, let me tell them. But secondly, every believer should be helping another believer to grow into more maturity in Christ. So I love this about our church, uh, and in many churches around, around Madison, right? That we're multi-generational. I love having, having Lynn around, and Lewis around, and, and different age groups. We have college students around. We have different people at different uh, 
phases of life, but also the different lengths of walking with Jesus. We have new believers in here. We have people that have been here for 20 years say, I love Jesus since I was young. So every believer should help other believers grow into being more mature. So let's turn to Pastor's favorite chapter, and I think a, 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 a good chapter for us, but let's go to Ephesians 4 because this is an important aspect of discipleship. If we're going to be a people that say, hey, it's essential to us to make disciples, church is going to grow, church is going to be here in 10 years because we're going to make disciples, it's essential to it for us to get this. But let's go, Ephesians 4, some of you guys know that Pastor Bob and Pastor Tina are off on vacation right now, they're celebrating their anniversary and um, having a blast, they went down to see the Noah's Ark down in, in Kentucky, they're headed over to Virginia. If you guys aren't on Facebook or aren't their Facebook friends, follow them on Facebook and you can see all their updates. They always like to take cute pictures while they're going on their anniversary trips. So um, they're having a blast. They, they just posted a few pictures this morning. So let's turn though, Ephesians chapter 4. Really believe this is the foundation of the setup of the church. <coughs> but Ephesians chapter 4 um, and verse 15. Pastor and I know that our responsibility in, in, according to verse 11, is that Christ gave us the leadership in the church to equip the church, everybody, all, all those that say they follow Jesus, to do the ministry. And what is the ministry? It's to build up others into maturity in Christ. Let's look at that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Well, verse, let's start in verse 14. Verse 14 talks about this. This is why we need to be focused on making disciples. Verse 14. If we're all attaining the maturity and attaining the whole measure and the fullness of Christ, we will not no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by every cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So we don't want to be a group of people, we don't want to be a body that's, that's tossed to a group. Somebody comes up with another idea and, about Jesus and, and we don't want to just follow whatever they're saying, we want to be grounded in the truth. And how is that going to, how is that going to be, um, how is that going to be accomplished in our midst? It's that we know the truth, and then that we speak the truth to each other. So we got to, we talked about the last message, last sermon series was uh, to flip the script. We got to know the script. So we got to know the truth. We got to know the word of God so that, that we're not deceived, we're not tossed to and fro. And then also that our responsibility, our opportunity is that each one of us would speak the truth to each other. <laughs> so I'm, I get together with my, my brother Dion for lunch, and so when we get together for lunch, and, we're going to be speaking the truth to each other. We're going to encourage each other where we are. We're going to make sure that we're grounded in truth. It's, it's our responsibility. Why? Because when we do that, when we speak truth to each other, what does it say? That we grow up into maturity. Verse 16. From him, uh, from him, the whole body is joined and held together by ever supporting ligament. Grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So we have a responsibility as believers, as followers of Jesus. It's not something in addition to being a follower of Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, I'm going to be speaking the truth to each other. I'm going to help build you up. I'm going to help encourage you. I'm going to help you mature into who Jesus is. And then, and then it's also each one of our responsibilities that we would speak the truth to each other. On Sunday morning, our, our hope and our goal is that we're equipping you guys to do that. We're going to focus on Sunday morning. We're going to have messages full of truth. We want to be, man, verse after verse. Let's, let's speak the truth because we know that's going to equip you guys also to know the truth. And then, hey, um, this week, and I'm going through something, or I hear my brother or sister is going through something, I want to be able to speak a truth answer, a Jesus answer to them, and not some uh, worldly or just good advice, but want to speak the truth. So we encourage you that every believer should be helping others to grow, because that's our responsibility. We know the truth. Let's speak the truth to each other. So we see that also in uh, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. They were one of my uh, favorite uh, <coughs> discipleship or discipling uh, verses to memorize and to think about. But 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, you know, Paul had this great example of, of making disciples. Paul was a missionary. He wrote most of the, the New Testament. He went to different places and planted churches. He started a church, then he would take a leader and put the leader there. He'd go start another church and 
be able to lead leader up and put him there. So Paul had this relationship with Timothy, and he's building a church, and so we, he's giving Timothy responsibility for this church to lead it, to, uh, to speak it, and it's really neat here. He says, do the work of evangelist. I won't talk about that this morning, but we'll focus here on 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. He's encouraging Timothy, his son. He says this, You then, my son, be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. I love this example, this, this picture of discipleship. Paul said, The things that you've heard me say in the presence of many people, so things that you hear Sunday morning, many people here, Men entrust to a lot of people who will also be able to entrust to others. This is kind of the pattern of discipleship, right? And we see this from Jesus. He said, I'm going to make, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. The things I've said, go and teach other people everything I've commanded you. Paul again repeats this with the same kind of phrase. Hey, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many people, entrust to other people who will also be able to train others. So this is a, a pattern of discipleship that that is in scripture, and again, that we want to see as an essential part of the church. That, hey, the things that you hear me say on Sunday morning, that here's the things that you hear God say to you through your reading of scripture, and trust that to other people who will then be able to see other people hear that, and then other people. It's, it's multi generational. That's what we want to see in the church at Calvary Church. We see as an essential part of, of God's church is that multiple people hear from God, and they trust it to another generation, and another generation. And we're going to have multiple people, multiple forms of people in this, in, in this church, meeting with each other, and encouraging each other, and speaking the truth to one another. So then Linda speaks to, and then gets Susan, and then gets Susan has another person they're going to be speaking to, and, and, and then those people will be able to teach others. And so we trust the words of God with other people. I, I say it this way, Everybody needs a Paul to pursue, a Barnabas to walk with, and a Timothy to train. So I want to, in my life, I'm always searching for somebody that's, hey, a step ahead of you in Jesus. I want to pursue them. I want to know them. I wanna, they have some wisdom. They have some things that they've walked through with God. I, I want to glean from that. Also, I, I also need Barnabas. I need, I need friends that, that, are, that are going to walk through this with me. And I always want to be looking for, who's that next generation? Who's that Timothy in my life that I can train and bring up in, in the fullness of who God is and, and all the understanding that I have? And that's how Paul did his ministry. He, he went with Barnabas and went and started churches. He was training the Timothy, other people that would lead the churches. And the same thing that we have this responsibility. The essential part of the church is that we will be people that have multi-generational discipleship on our mind. Who can I build up in Christ? Who can I lead into more maturity in Christ? So I said this early, I'll, earlier, and I'll say it again, and, and Pastor would agree with this statement. We don't need, there's no slew of qualifications that we need to disciple somebody. We just have to be following obeying Jesus. That's the only qualifications. Like, oh, I can't make a disciple. No, you're, you're a believer. You follow Jesus, you can make a disciple. You can teach somebody else what you know about Jesus. That's all it takes. So at Capital City Church, what does this look like? What does discipleship process look like? Does it look like Sunday school classes? You guys notice we don't have that many Sunday school classes. You know, we don't have a, a, a list of um, what is it, the, the Catholic catechism or anything like that that we have to, they have to go through. Um, what does it look like? So I think one is there's some formal discipleship. Formal and informal discipleship. We'll talk about those two things. Formal discipleship, there's some doctrine, there's some gospel foundations that we need to know. So, we have been doing, uh, once a quarter, a gospel fluency class. And so we're going to be working on that so that it fits our schedules better. I know showing up on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for a gospel fluency class doesn't really sound exciting. But we need to have some gospel foundations, we need to have some truth foundations in our life. And so we're, we're working, uh, what, would, what would be the best schedule for, our, for, for those in the body that can receive this understanding of the gospel? Why? Because the, the gospel is what we need to make disciples. We need to understand it. So when we apply it to other people's lives, it, it is formed this way, that Jesus is the answer for every problem they're going through. And so we want to train you how to speak the gospel to yourself, right? Sometimes I forget how good God is. I just met this week with um, a friend of mine, also named Linda, but uh, down at Purdue University. We got together and we're going, uh, we, we had some good Indian cuisine down there. It was so good. 
and we're chatting, we're talking about, hey, this is some struggle that we're going through in life, and she, she's also a minister, she was talking about a couple different things with me, and I was sharing, hey, what I'm going through, and, and we got to this point where like, why do we always forget how good God is? Oh, you guys go through that? It's like, you go down the road and you're like, oh yeah, why, I got myself in this mess again. Okay, thank you God for your forgiveness, and your grace in my life. But why do I always forget? Or we just went through with the missional community, we went through the Israelites, you know, and they're like, God, you're really awesome, and God blesses them, and then all of a sudden they find themselves, you know, worshiping a, a dead idol again. But we just have this tendency, we need each other to encourage one another in the gospel. And so we have to have an understanding of the gospel. And so we have a gospel fluency class that we did this month. We're going to do it again in the spring. But it's to help us form the gospel so we can encourage ourselves, remind us who we are in God, but also be able to speak to other people that Jesus is the answer in every problem. Mm -hmm. Now I want you, who has a smartphone? Anybody have a smartphone? Yeah, everybody got a smartphone. So I found out this, this week that... Um, a really good tool that I was going to recommend is only for the iPhone. If they, if I don't think they have it on Android. So, that's, for those of you who have Android, I'm sorry. And I'll, I'll pray, or maybe maybe we also have some computer engineers in here that could, or some computer software people, you could write this program for for this uh, church company. But there's a, if you have an iPhone, you can search on your app. Um, it's called One, and you have to put the space in there. One, number two, space, one, one-to-one -one discipleship tool. And this is a, a tool that you can use to build what we would say formal discipleship, the doctrines of faith. The, this is the basic that all believers should know. So it's called one-to-one. -one. They also have a paper version. We have a few in the office. So, the, so if you have an Android phone, you can carry around the paper version instead. But this is, this, is an opportunity, this is a tool that we can use to formally train each other to say, hey, what is the truth about who God is and what he's done? And, and this needs to get in all of us as a base ground, as a follower of Jesus. This is what needs to be the base for us. And so that's a tool that, that we say, hey, use that and be able to meet with somebody. You guys can go through those basic things. If you're a new believer, say, hey, Andrew, would you take me through that? Or do you know somebody that could take me through the one-to-one -one book? And this is just a basic way that we um, would be able to lay this foundation. You can take 30 minutes, maybe a lunch break, maybe a coffee break. Say, hey, can you go through this with me? It'll lay a basic foundation. One-to-one. -one. Is it Android also? Look at that. This is all Android. They didn't update their website yet. So it's on Android and iPhone. You guys can get it both ways. But one-to-one, -one, it lays a basic foundation of doctrine. It's a formal type of discipleship. But there's also informal discipleship. We talk about this a lot. It's living life together. Life on life. So we're getting, we're getting meals. Or we're, we're playing uh, Ultimate Frisbee together. And in moments, in moments like that, we're able to encourage one another because we get to know each other. You know, sometimes when we, we come here on Sunday morning, or we come to a Wednesday night missional community, and we can, it's kind of easy to hide who we really are, right? But when we're out, like, living life together, when we're out, like, pulling the weeds out there, and then, you know, we're just talking, and we're living life together, and we get to know each other better. We get to know where, hey, this person maybe not quite believe in Jesus where he needs to, and I can speak truth into his life. Or, or we get to know our, our neighbors, they can join with us, unbelieving neighbors, and, and they get to see Jesus in us while we're living life together. So it's an informal type of discipleship, but it, it, but it all enables us to be able to speak the truth to each other and be able to encourage each other to grow more and more into the maturity of Christ. And so we believe that Catholic City Church, that discipleship is essential to us as the believers, walk, our walk with Jesus, and for transformation of the city. We, gotta, we, gotta, we believe that we have to see ourselves as disciple makers. That's part of our identity. That's part of our identity as a Christian. We're not just a follower of Jesus. Hey, we're following Jesus. We're telling other people everything we know about Jesus. is what God wants for our lives. So how is this going to look um, going forward? You guys have heard us say this in the spring, and we're bringing it back again, and we're going to continue to to say it until we, to, until we see it happen. But uh, we really want to see what we would call DNA groups at Calvary Church. 
So we have, not only do we have, we have our Sunday morning gatherings, we get together, right? We have our missional communities where we gather together and study the word and we're living life together, doing fun things like going to Devil's Lake and game nights and, and having fun, inviting our neighbors into our, our everyday life. But we also have what we want to see with Dean Acres, where we see two or three people getting together on a regular basis to disciple each other, to walk with each other. I, mean, I mentioned we have a Paul that we pursue, a Barnabas that we're with, and a Timothy that we're training. Well, DNA groups are a way that we're gonna we're gonna get real with each other, right? Sometimes in a group like this, I can't really tell you everything that's going on in my life. Or when we're meeting in my living room, and there's like 15 of us sitting in the living room, or in pastor's living room, we got like 10 people sitting in the living room. It's really hard to like just be real and like tell me tell tell everybody what's going on. But in a DNA group, a small group of people, man, it's, it's a perfect environment for me to share. Hey, here's a mess that I'm actually going through. Could you help? Could you speak into this? And could you help see what what I'm doing? And so, I, I sent a slide, I, I don't know if you received it, William, um, but it's a, the DNA group, and it has uh, the three questions on there, discover, nurture, and action. But uh, that may, may show up here. But DNA, when we say a DNA group, what is the goal of that DNA group? It's to discover, to nurture, and to take action. We want to encourage you guys to find, if you're a male, got there, get, Get together with three males. If they're your females, say, hey, let's get together three females. And let's, let's together form a DNA group. A place that we can discover what God is saying to us. We can nurture. We can, we can ask how it challenges us. And we can, two, and we can, third, we can take action on that. We can hold each other to, hey, what are you going to do differently in light of what God just told you? So those three questions, again, are, one, what is God saying to you? Second is, how does it challenge or encourage you? And then third, what are you going to be doing different in light of what God spoke to you? And so when you ask those three basic questions, in the next the coming weeks, we're going to have a tool that you guys can have, put in your Bible, maybe with a little bookmark. Um, I just recently got a, a part-time job, so I'm learning how to balance my all the things I want to do at church and the responsibility that I now have uh, in, my, in my workplace. But uh, we, we're going to make a tool for us that we can have those three questions with us all the time. And on there are also going to be four people that we're praying for. So you get together with a group and say, hey, who's four people that we can pray for that they don't know Jesus yet, that we want to see them come to Jesus? And then the, the second part of that is going to be asking those three questions. Hey, this week, what is God speaking to you? What did, what did you learn new about God? Second question would be, how does that challenge you? How does that encourage you? And then the last one would be, what are you going to do differently? What's going to be different about your life in light of what Jesus spoke to you? And as we get together and we form these groups, it's going to begin to strengthen us. We're going to begin to mature in Christ because we're going to be speaking the truth together. We're going to be examining what God's saying to us. And it's got, all of this discipleship, no matter what form or fancy thing that you want to do, it's all based on truth. So we want it to be based on the Word. So if we're in the Word on a regular basis, God's going to be sharing things with us. He's going to be shaping us. We're going to be becoming more and more like Him. And so together we can grow as a stronger body as we disciple each other and we disciple those who are around us. We show others who Jesus is. That's what discipleship is. Showing other people who Jesus is. So this morning I want to, I want to close with a splitting down in groups. We've done this a few times before, um, but I want to I want to split down in groups, and and we're going to ask those three questions to each other. Hey, what is God saying to me? What was something new that I that I heard about? Maybe something that, something new that God said today. And then secondly, how does that challenge you or encourage you in your in your walk? And, and what are you going to do differently this week? Maybe some of you guys are decide, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna call up somebody from Captain Church. I'm, I want to meet together with lunch with them. I want to arrange our lunch together so we can get together. Or maybe um, you're going to get together with a few guys from your mission community or, or, or a few girls from your mission community and say, hey, how can, we, how can I rearrange our lives so that we get together more often so that we can encourage each other to grow in Jesus? So right now, let's take a moment. And um, William, you got some music to play. So uh, I trust him. He, he's good up there. I love William being back there. But let's take, let's take a few moments, uh, five minutes, and we're going to break down in groups. 
And I'm not going to make decisions on who could tell what group or where you're at. I, I maybe encourage you a little bit about that. Maybe think about your mission community who you already are living rhythms together. <coughs> but break down and say, ask those three questions, and they're up there. What's something new you learned? How did it challenge or encourage you? And what are you going to do differently in light of these things? Let's take five minutes. Let's break down.